And there was the original Radio Gaga dead set legend, Ross Ryan. And Ross is in the studio with us. Welcome to Radio Gaga, Ross. Thank you, Neil. Good to be here. And it's good to have you here. Um, the first song was Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs with Over the Rainbow. Now, you do know what the link is between that and yourself. You yes. might want to tell the listeners. Well, I was born in Kansas, which, of course, is um, where Dorothy from... Um, what the heck was it? Oh, that would have been the Wizard, Wizard of Oz, Oz came yeah. from. And, of course, I moved from America because I was born in Kansas and I... Uh, Came to Oz. And just like Dorothy, started singing and became famous. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, slightly better looking than Julie Garland, if you, Judy Garland, if you don't mind me saying so, too. So, Probably not at the age she did the movie, though. No, fair enough. No, that's fair <laughs> enough. No, you're looking a lot healthier than her, too, as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, you got out here when you were nine, according to what I read on your website. Yep. And what brought you out here? My mother was a war bride. And so, my dad was in submarines mm-hmm. in the US Navy. And uh, they met during the war. And after the war, she joined him in America. Sounds like a, a, a good thing to do to come back to Australia for her. Yes, yes. And, we, and um, when my dad retired from the Navy in 59, um, they came back to visit her family and we all came across. Um, uh, we migrated, yeah. We, I, 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 I used to think that we kind of just came to have a look and make up our mind, but we... We sent too much stuff over for it just to be that. <laughs> and the Navy paid for it all. We even oh. took a, even bought a new car and brought it over. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, wow. Well, this is a great song by the band The Waif. So you come across the one yes, called yes. Bridal Train? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yes. I know that one well. And uh, I suspect that would ring some bells with you. Absolutely. With yeah. yeah. Um, so you taught yourself to play guitar and then write songs. That I was seeming... always more interested in, in writing. That was the thing that I wanted to... That was my first love was writing songs. So I, I taught myself guitar to... To learn, to okay. learn something to write with. That was the yep. And that piece that we just heard, 606, which I didn't tell people about, um, was obviously one of yours as well. Yep. Obviously a little after you were turning, turned nine, I guess, yes, but we'll, yes, we'll, we'll get to that. Yes, <laughs> We'll get to that. So who were your main influences? Who did you want to be like when you were writing music? Um, I was always interested in pop music. Uh, even when I was still a, um, very young in America, I, my folks were pretty much into country music, so I heard a lot of Johnny Cash and Eddie Arnold and people like that. Um, so I've always had a love of comfy, country music. And when I got sort of in my sort of early teens, I was interested in pop music in general. But when the Beatles came along, um, you know, that was it really. They, they, they had a few hits, didn't they? They did. They, they kicked on all right. Yes, yeah. they did pretty well. <laughs> and this is down in Albany, south of Perth, as I understand yeah, it. Yeah, So uh, a guitar would have been a good friend, I would have thought, in that part of the world. Wouldn't have been much to do in the, the late 50s. No, no, I had a very boring childhood. I didn't have a neglected childhood. I didn't have a bad childhood. I just had a boring <laughs> childhood. You know, on, I was on a farm, um, a sheep farm, and... Uh, um, <laughs> It's almost like I just threw away my adolescence on this, um, on this farm, mainly because uh, it, it's, the area was um, a place called Green Range, and mm-hmm. it was um, close to the ocean, so the soil was quite sandy. And like most of the people who took up land down that area, you, you, you went in for kind of a lottery thing. Yeah, okay, it. yeah. And um, the land was, you know, really cheap. So to, to win it was kind of like winning a lottery. And... Um, but not many people who took up the land really had much background in it. And my dad, who was born in Montana, and his dad were ranchers and stuff. It was kind of in his blood, so he wanted to be a farmer. And um, he thought this would be a good idea, as, you know, a nest egg for the kids and stuff. But uh, I don't recall being invited to the family meeting where this was decided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but know. anyway, the, the end result was they just knocked all the trees down. So okay. within a decade, it's just what topsoil they had disappeared. So the government now... It's brought it all back. And I spent most of my adolescence picking up mallee roots and clearing <laughs> land. And but then they planted trees on it again. So it was kind <laughs> of like... It back in again. I spent my adolescence <laughs> digging this really big hole that they um, filled gone in. <laughs> <laughs> Total waste of time. It, it, it's kind of like going to prison, isn't it? And it <laughs> yes. <laughs> same sort of thing, breaking little big rocks into little rocks. So you got into the school musical, as I understand it, and uh, into a very cleverly named radio program. I might take the name on myself, the High School Half Hour, and yes, got into, yes. into local radio. Yes, that was uh, uh, the local radio station, 6VA, okay. decided to do a half-hour thing once a week. And um, myself and two of my friends, we um, got the gig to do it. Mm-hmm. it. Like most things I've done in my life, it was highly self-indulgent. Um, <laughs> in fact, we always played one Beatles song, everything that was 
being such a fan. So. Not the same one, or no, no, no. no we... was, we always, that was our, oh, that okay. was our signature <laughs> thing. A bit like your Radio Gaga. Song. Oh, okay. Was, uh, we always had to have a Beatles song sometimes. No, fair yeah. enough too. So you, you eventually got into bands and stuff around around town, and yep. and pl- played presumably just around Albany, did you? Given the isolation, there wouldn't be much around there that apart from Albany, or were you on the road a bit? No, I didn't go on the road. I mean, there'd be the odd gig in Narragin or something. But <laughs> I've been in Narragin. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, but no, it was mainly um, just around Albany. I was, I was. The first band was a band called The Set, with two T's, of course. Oh, of course, absolutely. Um, and I, uh, I played acoustic guitar and was the singer. And then I joined another band that was called Red Painted Blue, which was a pretty cool name. Yeah, it's, much you better can take than the it set. both ways. Yeah. Because it's either something that's red that's painted blue, yeah. or it's the other way around. Yeah. Know? So, um, and I played bass. Okay. I, I became a bass player. Now. Okay. And more recently, you've gone back to obviously acoustic and, yep. and lead stuff, but you're not doing the bass stuff anymore. No, no. I was probably the world's worst bass player. It was uh, bass is one of those instruments that's it's really easy to get going on it, but it's really hard to learn how to do it properly. Okay. And I was, you know. That word self-indulgent again. <laughs> I was a really self-indulgent bass player because it's such a low frequency. People can't really tell if you've hit wrong notes, and I would just, you know, play a million notes. You know, anything to do with groove or feel oh, okay. was yeah. beyond my um, <laughs> understanding at that stage. <laughs> no, I have a, a fourteen-year-old myself who is learning bass, which um, is it's always entertaining to have a. Uh, a person learning music around you, you know. Yeah. Particularly when it's bass, because it's such a, a dun, wonderful dun, instrument to hear dun, just by itself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the standing joke in our place, and, and we said the same thing last week when, with uh, last month with Mike Rudd here, he stopped playing bass and, and became a musician. And I went home and said to my, <laughs> went home to my son and told him that, and it wasn't p- particularly popular. Uh, hello, Sam, if you're listening. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you, you moved on and, and got into music after playing bass, and then you went up to Perth to, get, to work at Channel 9. Yeah, uh, when I left school, I... I was still on the farm for a while, and my brother and my sister had already disappeared, and I was the last one standing, you know, and there was a certain amount of guilt that we only got this farm for you kids. Oh, yes, excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. nice. Uh, Very helpful. And, um, but, uh, no, I had a calling. And uh, and I thought, well, I, I knew that I couldn't be a Beatle, mm-hmm. but I thought I could be Wrong George haircut. Martin. Okay. Yeah, I thought maybe, and so I went... I wanted to become a record producer, which was yep. not really even a job description in those days, yeah. particularly in WA. Um, and I managed, uh, by chance, to get a job as an audio operator at Channel 9 in Perth. And that would be fairly big time compared with Albany, I would have thought. It was a tad. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when you were there at Channel 9, using the equipment they had, you were able to record an album called Home Movies. Yeah, kindly the management let me go in after hours, and uh, I recorded an album of my teenage angst songs. Mm. Um, I think there was someone called Christine, according to a yes, website yes, I read somewhere. Christine, yes, Christine okay. had a fair run on the uh, on yeah, the receiving she, end. Yeah, she certainly was an inspiration for me um, writing lots of songs at one stage. Because <laughs> yeah, when the relationship broke up, I didn't take it too well. Being right. a serious young insect. Yeah, but hey, <clears throat> launched a music career. It did indeed, and that's no, no, a, good I thing. a great debt. Uh, yeah, and so over time, you, you obviously became uh, a bit more of the music scene in Perth, and a bloke called Roy Orbison stumbled into your life. Yes, he did. The big um, O. After what I'd, happened there? After I'd done the, the Home Movies album, which once again was a, an exercise in the process of recording an album rather than promoting a career or trying to make myself known, I just wanted to learn the process. So, I mean, to the fact that, you know, I, I recorded this thing and... Uh, um, the album and had you know eighty copies pressed and had covers made you know went the the whole mm-hmm. bit. Um, the the people from Aztec who released the my my name means horse album last uh, year before last now um, were saying you were probably one of the first indie acts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because of that album, um, <clears throat> which is of course unlistenable, yes, um, mainly because it doesn't exist anymore. Or do you still have a copy? Oh, no, I still have a copy. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, there's a couple of tracks that I put on it on that the, the stuff album. That okay, I was about. yeah. Um, uh, because it was such a novelty and a lot of booth announcers would, I, who were radio jocks in, yep. in, um, in Perth knew of the project that I was doing. So they were all going, well, when you finally finish it, you know, you know sling us a copy. Yep. So, of course, I did that. And um, a couple of stations started playing tracks, you know. And that was more in the days when, um, the, of the radio personalities who played what they liked. Yep. And uh, so I... Uh, I got some airplay and, and I had a bit of a profile, mm-hmm. which helped me get some gigs just doing folk venues and wine bars and things. And through that connection, um, Roy Orbison came to Perth 
and his support act. He was, Perth was the second date on the tour he was doing. He'd been to Darwin and then he came to Perth. And his support act, there was a, I think his wife was ill. He left the tour and they needed somebody sort of quickly and I was mm-hmm. recommended. And oh, uh, the promoters liked what I did yep. and asked me to do the rest of the Australian tour. Excellent. And, uh, and I got offered recording contracts and stuff <laughs> after that. And I thought, it was what, these people are out of their minds, but okay, I'll do this for a bit. So in a sense, I got to become a Beatle. Yeah, excellent. And, and you know, Roy Orbison played with George Harrison. The, in the, 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 the Beatles, Wolverines. in fact, even before that, he had oh, already okay. done some. He had toured England with the, the Beatles that supported Roy Orbison. Oh, really? In England but before oh, they, they they broke, or just oh. as they were about to break. Hereafter, you are the sixth Beatle because there was a fifth Beatle already, wasn't it? Yes, that's true. It? So yes. you're now the sixth Beatle. <laughs> it was probably up to about 250 at this stage. You read all the books. <laughs> yeah. So, was the, what was the most amazing thing about being on, on tour with an inter- international superstar? I mean, uh, it was just it was incredible. I mean, what can I tell you? Yeah. Um, it was. Um, I mean, I had, one of the big novelties was that I'd never been on a plane before. So, oh, okay. So suddenly I was flying around Australia. Um, I'd never played in front of more than a, probably about 100 people. Yep. And that was at a school musical. Yep. Um, and suddenly I'm playing to crowds of five and six to 8,000 people. What sort of venues? Oh, you know, Festival Hall here, okay. Horton Pavilion, you know, yep. the usual yep. suspects. Okay, yeah. Not Rod, Rod Laver for obvious reasons. No. He, he was still playing tennis yeah. rather at that stage, wasn't he? But uh, No, that was, it, was, it was quite an extraordinary thing. And just being with, you know, Roy Wilson was certainly uh, amongst the clutch of heroes. I've always been a big fan of his. Yep. Um, and he was such a lovely guy, real yeah. southern gentleman. Yeah. 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 It was a real honour. Yeah, so after, as you said, you got your EMI contract yep. and created an album called A Poem You Can Keep. That's right. And a song called I Don't Want to Talk About It won Record of the Year in 1973. Mm-hmm. Now's the first, a good opportunity to, for the first plug, I think, isn't it? <laughs> on, this, uh, on this very excellent album that I've got here in my hand. Is it on it? Yeah, because I don't, I, I don't want to know about, about it. About it, it is. So yeah. track three on the Ross Ryan, the difficult third compilation album, <laughs> which we're going to talk a bit more about very soon, but... There's the first plug. It's a really good album, and it's available from Ross's website, but we'll talk a bit more about that down the track. So um, you're also Best New Talent at that stage yes. in Australia. So th- these are pretty big raps that um, that have obviously put you in good stead since. Well, it, like I said, it all got happened very quickly. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, um, I've, uh, on my website, actually, if, if people are interested, um, there's a, I didn't put any cover notes on this compilation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I put extends. I spent about six weeks putting up um, cover notes and videos and all sorts of memorabilia that track by track you can go through. Yep. And in these notes, I, I I mentioned that I I sort of paid my dues in reverse. Yep. Because from not even having a, any ambition to be a singer <laughs> to suddenly <laughs> touring with Robeson and having a hit album that became Record of the Year and and Best New Talent that just happened in a space of months. Yep. was kind of like, you know, at the time I'm thinking, God, how hard can this be? You know? <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, there's all these people cutting their legs off trying, yes, exactly. <laughs> trying to get in. Uh, <laughs> and so that got you opportunities to work with people like Brian Cadd and, and, and Ariel for the first yes, time. Yes. And you, since then, you've obviously done support tours. And some of the names that you've, you've supported, the Hollies, Helen Reddy, Roberta Flack, Dr. Hook, mm. I mean, the names just mm. sort of roll off the tongue. Of any of those, do you have a particular favourite? You've got to say Ariel because we had Mike Rudd in here oh, last yeah. month. Yeah. Well, no, Ariel, for sure. <laughs> yeah. But of the international guys? Is it, uh, of, um, there was only one bad one, and that was Roberta Flack, but it was only just because she was a... a how can I put this without being sued? Um, <laughs> difficult to work with? She was difficult to work with. I mean, I, I didn't have to work with her. Yeah. Um, but the feedback I got, I remember the first night of the tour was in Brisbane and uh, I was in the dressing rooms downstairs and I was just tuning up my gu- guitar ready to go on. And she was down there as well, um, just having a cup of tea or something. And uh, there was nobody else around. So I went up and introduced myself. And I said, oh, Miss Flack, my... My name's Ross Ryan. I'm your support act for this tour. Just pleased to meet you. And she just looked straight through me and just walked away. And um, I later heard from the promoters that she um, she was kind of... Was, um, how can I... No, no, no. She had problems with dealing with anybody that was white. Okay. Okay. So yeah. she'd only talked... You had to work through her a stylist or her hairdressers if you actually wanted to speak, okay. uh, yep. send a message to her. Yep. So that was the first time ever she saw your face? Yes, and, and probably the last, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but the best one to answer your question, would, without doubt, uh, was the two tours I did with Dr. Hook. Yep. 
Dr. Hook um, at that stage were really big in Australia, um, but their their profile had waned in America. So when they came to Australia, they were treated you know more godly yep. than they were in America. Um, and they, like I said, I did two tours with them. The first one I did. Um, went really well when they came back about a year later. They asked for me, which I was very oh, excellent. chuffed. Yeah, and uh, but that tour was great in as much that one they were hilarious guys. They came across that way, didn't they? And, and they were sincerely funny people. Yeah, um, and it was a totally democratic tour. Everybody from you know the lowest of the lowest the sport boot act <laughs> through the road crew yeah. to them and everybody had the same accommodation same transport there was no prima donnas everybody yeah. it was a real that kind of hippie communal thing and yeah. it was a lot of fun yeah and the music was good oh absolutely yeah and i would have thought that one of the worst things about being a support act would be if the you know if you don't like the music of the person you're supporting you know you'd just have to sit around and listen and admit, you know but if you like the you'd be able to get a free oh, concert and so, and I, well fortunately i didn't like roberta flax music very much so i just left after oh, okay. my set. <laughs> fair enough so 1974 you released an album called my name means horse which obviously <laughs> was just a monster in terms of your career um turned triple gold as i understand it mm-hmm. And there was a song called I'm Pegasus, which everyone I've told that you've been, as I said to you earlier before we went on air, that uh, everyone had told that Ross Wright, oh, I'm Pegasus. It's mm-hmm. the immediate thing that's, that's linked to well, you. It was so stupidly huge. Yeah. I mean, it was because it took so long for it to chart and to crawl its way to number one, and it took ages for it to come down that it was really played for a new year. It was just one of those things that was always there, wasn't it? I, yeah. I don't want to make a big thing of this. I was in year seven at the time, but I just remember. Year seven, it was just everywhere. And I, I remember one time uh, when it was you know, in the top ten, um, driving across, I was, I, when I was living in Sydney, driving across the Harbour Bridge and to put the radio on and there's Pegasus. And I kind of went, oh, I've heard that. Hit a button, it was there again. Another, <laughs> oh, really? Hit another button, three stations were playing it simultaneously. Wow. And I, I thought to myself at the time, this is a golden moment, Ross. Just remember <laughs> Take, this one. Yeah. This ain't going to happen again. <laughs> right. It's this sort of musical equivalent of Groundhog Day, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I thought, oh, okay, oh, that's wow. pretty special. Yeah. So the, the song you wrote, uh, yep. where did it come from? What's it, what's it all mean? I mean, where did it come from? Why, where did the, how did it come about, the song? It really is kind of a free association song, and, and it really, it, it honestly was started out to be a comedy song, um, because Ross does mean horse. Mm-hmm. Um, I looked it up in a baby book, and, um, and and I thought it was kind of funny. Yep. So, um, uh, so I, I was working on a song like that, and then at the same time, I was um, had a crush on this an air hostess, um, and uh, the relationship wasn't doing that well, and. Um, so I combined the two songs and got the flying horse thing, mm-hmm. the air hostess flies and yep. the horse thing. And, um, and of course, I knew that Pegasus, I'd already heard of Pegasus. Mm. Um, so I just kind of fell out like that. It was, like I said, but it was still, in fact, when I, before we recorded it, and we did this quite a bit before the album, probably six months before the My Name Means Horse album mm. came out, hence that's why we called the album that. Yep. Um, <clears throat> uh I was playing it around at various places and, and presenting it as a comedy song with a whole spiel about you know, my disastrous relationship with yeah. this thing and how, how shattered I was that Ross means horse and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, and I took it into Peter Dawkins, who was uh, my producer at EMI, and of the, the brace of songs that we were looking for a single. And, uh, and he picked that as the one, and I kind of went, no, nah, come on, that's... Yeah, you know. very serious. <laughs> um, so I... I I do think that the success of that song is really Peter's because Peter's heard something in that that certainly I didn't. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that it's a... So it's not one of the best songs I've written. I think I've written better songs. But as a record, and there's, there's quite a difference yeah. between the two. Yep. Um, as a record, I think that it's a, a, a really good record. And it certainly was uh, in the right place at the right time. And I think that Peter Dawkins really deserves... Quite a bit of the credit for that. So do you reckon it's helped or hindered having a massive song like that? Oh, it's, it's, I, I refer to it as my albatross foot in the door song. <laughs> okay, fair um, enough. Oh, no, it's, it's been a big help. And, and um, it's interesting to have something that you've created that's actually more famous than you are. Yeah. And I quite like that. Yeah. I quite like we- the fact that the, the work is what people remember and whether who did or not, to me, is slightly irrelevant. Yeah, because I think 
you know, sitting in that seat four weeks ago, we had Mike Rudd, as I said, mm. from Spectrum, and he's in exactly the same position mm. with uh, I'll Be Gone. Yep. You know, we, we played 10 different snippets of 10 different people singing I'll Be Gone, you know, and played a game of Who's This Playing It. Mm. The good news was he picked Mike Rudd and the Heaters. I was a bit concerned he might, guess, <laughs> might get that one wrong. So this led to the 1974 most popular Australian album mm-hmm. and meeting Gough Whitlam, who yes. presented one of your gold records. But, right. How did that come about? There was an election on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> say no more. <laughs> Um, I had put up my hand prior to that. Um, I'd been asked by the Labour Party um, if I would do a few sort of gigs and stuff yep. and lend, lend my name to things, and I was quite happy to do that. Yep. I was and still am a big goth fan. Yep. Um, and by chance, during he'd, it was the f- second election and the second one that he won yep. um, that, he was, that was underway at the time when... The horse album went gold, yep. and you know his people and my people <laughs> got together uh, and um, arranged for it to happen. And to my knowledge, and I'm really happy, I would be quite happy to be um, uh, proved wrong here. But I, I've done a bit of research. Um, you, you've heard of the internet, uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, Getting on computer now, apparently. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I'm the only person to ever get a, a gold album or a platinum album from a sitting prime minister. Oh, that's good. Um, Got to be happy with that. I, I thought maybe the Seekers may have, but I yeah. had a look and... Um, well, they're Australian of the Year or something. They yeah, probably got that sort of award. slightly better, yes. Well, it depends, yeah. <laughs> I still haven't worked out how four people can be the Australian of the Year, but that's that's another <laughs> another story, another time. Well, we're going to hear said song, I Am Pegasus, but we're not going to hear the normal one that we've heard on the radio a thousand times. This particular one comes off, said he, doing another plug, the recently re-released My Name Means Horse album, which is out... I don't know why I'm picking it up. I'm picking it up to show Ross. I think you've probably yes, seen it before, haven't you? Yeah, it's, this is the album here. Um, and this has a couple of bonus tracks on it. Aztec Records re-released this in 2006, seven, seven-ish. Mm-hmm. And I picked mine up at JB, but you can get it in all good record stores, yeah. and I guess a couple of ordinary ones as well. Not to mention from my site. And also from the website. <laughs> we better tell them what it is, because they're all, they're all hovering over the keyboard. Why don't it's www.rossryan.com. It's hard to remember, isn't it? www.rossryan.com. And you get a better version of it from you, don't you? Because you get your autograph on it. Yes, everything gets signed. Yep. So uh, if you want a, an autograph copy, go to Ross's website. But this album comes from a TV program called, or this album, this version of Iron Pegasus comes from a TV show called GTK, which was on the ABC, wasn't it? It stands for Getting to Know. Is that right? Mm-hmm. There you go, today's piece of trivia. <laughs> and uh, it came from 1973, this was done. Um, and so this is live on GTK. We're talking to Ross Ryan, and it's 23 minutes to four here on 94.1 FM 3WBC. Um, that wasn't Neil's fault. That's not, in, in fact, the track. Um, and, and the fault is, in fact, um, Aztec. They, on the oh. track listing on the back, they um, left one of the numbers out in the middle of it. Um, so, um, so we now need to have a They have assured me that this will be uh, on their next release of it. When they do the next run, they're going to correct this. So you have a collector's item there, Neil. Well, I do, don't I? And that's absolutely sensational, but that's not going to help me find it at the end, <laughs> is it? So what I'm going to get you to do is you had a TV program called Rock Show. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a bit about that program? And I'm going to try and find it here on my iPod. Okay. That'd be, that'd be good. Okay. Um, okay, Rock Show is a show that was sponsored by EMI that was done in Brisbane. And I was asked to be compare of the first version of it. Um, and it was mainly a vehicle for promoting EMI product, really, under the guise of being just a normal rock show. And that was on Channel 9, do you say? Count. Can't it wasn't ABC, clearly. No, no, it wasn't, no. no. Um, I can't remember what station it was. I think it was on Channel 9, I think Somewhere I remember. Brisbane, anyway, yeah. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, I did that for, it was a weekly thing, and I did that for about six months, and then they they rotated compers. I think Mike McClellan did it after okay. me. Okay, yep. Um, but I think they got a bit peeved, because I used to, to um, send up some of the songs that were coming up, <laughs> and sort of go, look, what are they, I don't know why they're playing this one, you know, that kind of I did actually determine, and we're just going to hear the song, because I think I've now found it. I'm going to have another go and see if we can get it to play. But um, comedy is also something that you enjoy doing, and uh, mm. I suspect that they might have known what they were letting themselves in for. No, no. They, I, I don't <laughs> think that they ever really got my sense of humour in life. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to have a go at Iron Pegasus, live from GTK 1973, unless the listing on my iPod's wrong as well. So let's have another go and see whether we get it. You're listening to 94.1 FM 3 WBC. 
and you're back here on 94.1 FM 3WBC. I'm Neil Butler and this is Radio Gaga and our very special in-studio guest is Mr Ross Ryan, our first ever dead set legend and uh, we've just heard him playing I Am Pegasus um, live on GTK and also the release of Blood on the Microphone we heard (laughs) first 20 or 30 seconds about that. So apologies for that but we are going to name and shame the man from Aztec Ted Lethburg, he he was the person responsible for... um for um, missing out one of the um, track numbers on the listing on the back of the album. Ted, Ted, Ted. Mm, okay. I'm going I'm to put mine on eBay now because it's close. Oh, it'll I'm, be worth a lot of money someday. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mine isn't signed, by the way, but that's okay. I've got every other I had one a competition on my website to ask people to, to find as many mistakes as <laughs> they could. I did say that. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and, and uh, there's, there's two women um, from opposite sides of the continent sent in these lists and I, you know, the whole thing is be as pedantic as you like. Yep. They found all sorts of grammatical things, the slight <laughs> factual errors. The, the list came to about 250. <laughs> <laughs> you almost get yourself your own website on that, couldn't you? <laughs> so um, after your, your music career started to um, wind down, I think, is in terms of your live, the whole pop star thing, mm-hmm. you started to um, do some other stuff, including uh, some live shows going around, and you recorded some live shows for EMI, mm-hmm. which apparently got overwritten. Yes, I, I um, the the idea was to do to follow up the My Name Means Horse album, which was the second album, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with a live album because the the recorded material was you know anything less than cheery. Um, it was mainly you know a lot of them was even t- teenage angst songs. Um, so it was all a, a, a bit down, whereas my live shows um, were sort of semi-comedic. I, I do a lot of you know, comedy stuff. And um, and there was, you know, I'd, it was, even to the extent that I'd um, run into people or, e- or even just emails that have happened, say, in the last, well, since I had emailed, since I started <laughs> receiving it, um, of people going, oh, look, I'm really glad to hear that you last found happiness after all these years. So that they've never seen me live. <laughs> That's right. You can determine the ones that have been there, can't you? So the idea was to do a live album um, of uh, here in Melbourne of a bunch of campuses. I used to do a lot of campus touring. And in fact, that was most of the work that I did um, in the 70s and early 80s was um, campus stuff. Um, I've got a feeling that you came to Melbourne State College, University of Melbourne while I was there. Absolutely. Yeah, so I probably saw you play yeah. then. You don't, why didn't you say hello? Um, well, you didn't come up. Oh, that's a point. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my fault. Yeah, I knew it would be my fault. Um, and uh, we recorded about four shows for, uh, 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 for a live album. And the tapes went back to Sydney. And Peter Dawkins, producer Peter Dawkins, his secretary accidentally mislabeled them. Um, and they were put back in circulation and... They were re-recorded and never heard of since. Now, here's the important Truly question. Truly the lost Ross Ryan album. <laughs> Absolutely lost. Do you own a copy of 1001 Strings? That's the question <laughs> that I want to know. <laughs> As you said, you, you obviously, and, and I've, I've seen Ross live quite recently, um, not here, but at Mooney Valley Legends mm-hmm. uh, on, the, on the 4th of Jan, and uh, the show is really a, a combination of, of music and, and light-heartedness, isn't it? Mm. You know, you're know, you not standing up there saying, hey, I'll tell you the one about the... the I'm not a stand-up work. comedian. No, no. Clearly. I've, I've tried <laughs> that, but no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> believe me, I'm not a stand-up <laughs> comedian. Where does your passion lie? M- music, writing music, performing mm. music, comedy? What, what do you love doing most? I suppose the thing that drives me is still writing, which I find harder to do as I've got older. Mm. And I'm, I'm sure you would have heard the same story from Mike Rudd. Yeah. Um... But I suppose I enjoy entertaining. There is a, a real buzz out of connecting with a, a crowd of people. Yeah. Um, uh, and comedy is the quickest way to do it. I mean, the reason I got the Roy Orbison tour wasn't they thought, gee, he's an upcoming songwriter. It was because I walked out on stage and said, you're looking at fear personified. <laughs> and everyone laughed. Yeah. And I explained to them how I managed to get the gig and how weird it was. And I'd only ever played to 20 people or whatever at a wine bar. And... I think they connected with the person. So I, I could have played anything and it had a context. Yeah. They weren't being saying, oh, he didn't, that actual chord's an E minor seventh and he was just playing a normal E minor. Yeah. They were being entertained. And, yeah. I, and I got, I, I was asked to do the rest of it because um, they thought I was entertaining. Yeah. And I think that's it's a really good word because like I went to work on the Monday after coming out and seeing you play at Movie Valley. I was only there for an hour and the show went for three hours. But 
people said, you know, what did you do at the weekend? I said, I went and saw Ross Ryan play. Oh, yeah. It's like that's the song about the horse, isn't it? You know? And I said, yeah, that's right. And they said, what else does he do? You know, because he's only got one song, you know, yeah. and clearly that's not the case. We, we stretch it out. Yeah. It's three a, hours. <laughs> 74 versions of the same song. No, and and that, that was exactly how I described it. Yeah. You know, he entertains people, and there's the odd joke, and the, the, with um, your two sidekicks there, a bit of a laugh with them, and you know, it, it is really an entertaining afternoon's activity rather than just going to hear music. It's really a, an interactive thing, you know. Neil at the next table who didn't know who originally did "Stand by Me" or whatever it was, <laughs> um, whatever the song was that you were talking about. I just about freaked when you said Neil, I know the answer, and I thought, hang on, um, no, I won't. And how does he know who I'm here? <laughs> um, so in 2003, moving forward quite a way, you released this album, which I'm now waving about, called One Person Q, your first non-compilation album for a while. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the last album I did for EMI was called Smiling for the Camera. So I yep. did four albums for them, and that came out in 77, 78, something like that. Yep. <clears throat> and, and... And I didn't do an album again until 2003. There was a there was an album actually called the, the Lost Ross Ryan album, right? Um, which I just did it on a cassette because they didn't have CDs in those days. Yep. Um, that you could burn at home. Um, and I also did a live album that was called um, You Can Trust Me I'm a Musician that mm-hmm. also came out on cassette. Um, and but I'm so, but I I'm such a slow writer. And I had dropped out of the scene for quite a while. I got sick of touring. If you're not going to tour, yep. then it's kind of pointless, really. Um, <clears throat> or do gigs, at least. And I got to uh, fulfill my early ambition, of course, to be a record producer. So I, in Glen Iris, I, um, in a friend's garage, set up a studio mm-hmm. called GI Recorders. I'll, and, I'll just stand uh, here and just sit here and think about what GI stands for. Yeah, mm. it's a drink. Yeah. <laughs> um, remember GI Cordial? No. Oh, okay, nice. No. You're too young. Yeah, far too young. Um, That's what happens when you're 27. Yes. Uh, And the idea of putting the studio together was really to record an album, you know, because I'd had three decades to write it. I actually had some material (laughs) to to draw on. Um, But as soon as I kind of set it up, um, I ended up by osmosis getting lots of work doing demos and albums for other people, including one for Spectrum. I did did the Spill album. Yep. And at one stage, so after doing this for several years and still not finishing my own, uh, my wife Tina said, I want to hear this album now. (laughs) So I I didn't take any more clients and finished it off. And I finished it just in time because there was a huge flood that happened in um, uh, in 03, 03, um, which... um, Decimated the studio. Oh, really? And um, but I'd finished my album. That's so, right. No, I had a then. few clients left over, but you know. Yeah, that's not that's their problem. <laughs> I finished them in my lounge room. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna hear a song um, from One Person Cube, which is also on the new compilation album. Yes. And this song's called Cool River. And if you want to see the film clip, you can go to rossryan dot com and see the film clip. And I think you could also get it on YouTube. Or do I only see it on YouTube? Is it on your your? It's on your well, website. I, I just got a link to the YouTube. Oh, oh okay. the clip's actually on the CD as well. Is it? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't put it in big enough type on the album people okay. only discover it when they when they put the um cd in to rip it oh okay <laughs> which i wouldn't have done of course oh no but yeah, yeah. Oh, but i will Personal now uses, okay. <laughs> okay we're going to hear cool river from ross ryan and the time is nine minutes to four on 3wbc <laughs> Okay, and that was Cool River by Ross Ryan, who's live in the studio with us. Now, Ross, you're doing a bit of live performing around town to promote your new album, which we are now going to talk about, the thir- difficult third compilation, 1973 to 2008. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that, the album. Well, it is the third one. Um, there was an album that came out called I Thought This Might Happen when mm-hmm. I split with EMI. Mm-hmm. That was the first one. Yep. And then I did one that came out that EMI released about 1990, I think. Um, that was called The Greats of Ross. Um, they never got that either. Um, <laughs> I got it. Different it sounds much better when you say it, though, than when you read it. I was going to use, but the Sex Pistols got there first. I was going to use Flogging a Dead Horse. But yep. They used that for one of their compilations. Yeah. I thought, damn. <laughs> um, and, of course, the, 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 as you would know, the, the present title comes from, you know, when, when you're recording and stuff, that, that cliche of it's always the difficult third album that yep. every act confronts. So yep. I, I Another attempt at humour. Um, but this is the first one that I've put out myself. I did a deal with EMI that I've uh, leased some of them my... Because they own the, the stuff. So about two-thirds of it's theirs, theirs and the rest of it I own. Um, so Coat Hanger, which is my business name, yep. um, 
is um, it's her first release. Okay. So, oh, actually, in a second. Uh, one, but the first one that's um, done of some of the old stuff. So. Yep. Um, and like I said, it's um, it hasn't got any cover notes, but they're all online, and they're much we wouldn't have fitted them on for what I did. So. RossRyan.com. Yes. The uh, the early song that that we talked about before, I don't want to know about, is on it. Yep. And we've got something that is unreleased before this album in terms of Queensland. So it's absolutely every sort of covers all all parts of your career, doesn't it? I wanted to put something um, new on it that was you know unavoidable. Yep. And. Um, and I'd, it was a, Queensland was a song I'd written a, few, a couple of years ago, and I uh, thought, no, nah, that's that's worth a, a trot. This is a good place to put that one. Yep. Um, and I'm now I've since discovered that that um, Queensland is celebrating their 150th anniversary of their uh, being their own colony. They split from New South Wales yep. 150 years ago. So, if there's anybody who worked for the Queensland Tourist Bureau, just give me a call. Uh, put we, it on my website. Well, we'll we'll see what we can do because. Yep. Ninety-seven percent of all members of the Queensland Tourist Board listen to this program. I'm told. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'll, if you're listening out there, please give us a hoist. Awesome hoi. demographic. That's it. Now we've got a couple of gigs coming up. Uh, the first one is the official CD launch. I, I would have thought now that you've been on Radio Gaga, that's the official sub launch because this, of course, is the official official launch. Well, to be honest. This is the official. We're about to have the the official post launch. Oh, okay. I actually, last time I played Capers, which was in July, I think, um, I was hoping to have the compilation ready by then. So that became the pre-launch, because it wasn't. Right. And then before Christmas, we got stock, and I wanted to be able to sell it through my site. Um, that became the the soft launch. Right. <laughs> and now we're having the official post-launch. So this, is this the... Can we it's say this... compilation. I could do it for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's right. Can we call this the official community radio launch? Absolutely. Because we just want to... We've got to push this up a no, bit. No, no, this it, is good. No, yeah, I like this, that. This is the, the official community radio launch. International community radio launch. Oh, nice. Yeah. How are we doing? Big, yeah, yeah. yeah. Going over the net to the world. Absolutely. And all those listeners listening on radiogaga.org.au... Can I just quickly say something? Sure. If you buy... You can buy the um, compilation... It's in shops and stuff. Yep. Um, through Aztec, they're distributing it. Bless them. But if you buy it from my website, not only is it signed, yeah. duh, 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 but um, as a bonus to the people that are on my mailing list, or whoever buys it, I've included a free album of stuff that's never been released called The Stuff Album. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's the only place you can get it. Because it's kind of material that's, if you're a, a vague fan or something, mm. you'd be interested because a lot of it's kind of embarrassing and yep. hilarious and yep. stuff but that's one bonus of buying it it is me. and i have that i have that album you but have. because i was doing the research for this i now have four ross ryan albums whereas i had none previously so <laughs> i haven't quite got through haven't quite got through the stuff yet <laughs> you'll see a, a surge in your records so. that an old conscience i couldn't possibly sell but i wanted it out there <laughs> yeah. so in fact you're selling that and you're chucking in free the, the difficult third compilation and you can't say fairer than that. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell that to EMI when they want the royalties. That's it. I'm yeah. just I'm just helping you here. I'm your marketing expert. But Saturday the 21st of February at the New Capers, 124 Burwood Road. Yep. Uh, and that'll be both dinner and or show. Yep. So you can hoe in for a feed first. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can get that from your website. Details about that, yep. the phone number and stuff. And there's a day out on the 15th of February, a Sunday afternoon. Uh, in fact, a Sunday day from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Royal Talbot Rehabilitation Centre yes. in Kew, which is going to be a huge Huge day, and some names that just sort of flash across the list of people that are going to be there: Shane Howard, Goanna, yes, uh, Mike Rudd, and Bill Putt from mm-hmm. Spectrum, and a gentleman called Ross Ryan. Apparently, his name meant horse. I read yeah. somewhere. So please, yeah, and uh, Keith Potger from yes, the Seekers. I've never met Keith. I'm looking forward to meeting Keith. Yeah, well, so am I. When he becomes the next Dead Set Legend, said he, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, <laughs> <laughs> if you're having a conversation. Now, we've talked about your website three or four times, but it really is a great website. Some of the websites that Muso's put out are very ordinary, and they're all about, um, I, I think, purely and simply selling records. But mm. yours actually is an engaging website, which is, is entertaining. It's got film clips, and it's got ability to buy CDs and stuff, and it gets a real sense of who Ross Ryan is. And uh, I would certainly recommend, do yourself a favour. I've got to say that once a show, right? <laughs> do yourself a favour. You get on to www.rossryan.com and uh, you find out all about Ross. You can buy his CDs. You can do all sorts of stuff. It's kind it's- of a parody of other people's websites, my site. It is, <laughs> yes. It, it, is a, it is a very different website, one that I've, I've been back to several times. So uh, by all means, get on there and have a look at that. Ross, thanks for taking half of your Sunday afternoon out to be it's with us. It's my pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. It's uh, being a local boy. We're very pleased that you were our first ever Dead Set legend. You have now I officially am totally been re- honoured to death. 
Thanks. Excellent. And you've got the, the very limited edition Radio Gaga T-shirt. If only you could see it, folks. It's awesome. It, it is an amazing yeah. version. And it's not the same one that Mike Rudd was wearing in the photo on my website. It is a different shirt. As I must long as con- it wasn't. Okay, yeah, no, because he has worn that one. And that, you know, we, we don't want to go yeah, there. Yeah. Ross, thanks for being here. We're going to hear the song Queensland. And uh, I'm sure that you'll have people dropping in your website very soon. Am I right in saying you can download Queensland from the web for free? You can, you can get Queensland from free to MP3. Just follow the links. Only at rossryan.com. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to hear Queensland, <clears throat> said he, hopefully, hoping he presses the right button. Uh, thanks again, Ross. Ross.